Welcome to Contenders Bible School, Bibliology and How to Study the Bible. This is a review of the midterm test. Teachers using this video in class may pause the video playback at any point for classroom discussion. 24 definitions for the 24 fingers and toes of the son of Rapha. Some people have wondered what that was all about. It was kind of num uh, just a little bit of numerology wrapped in an enigma. I thought I'd throw that in there as a teaser. Some people figured this out right away. Uh, it's in 2 Samuel chapter 21 and verse 20. The son of Rapha had six fingers and six toes. On, and so you, you add that all up and you get 24 fingers and toes. Is it a significant thing? Well, I don't know. I know that the Bible does mention that he had that many fingers and toes, and I know that the number 24 does have significance. But I also like numbers, and I wanted to make sure that you had 24 definitions because we had a lot of things to get through. First of all is general revelation. What may be known by all in nature, in history, and conscience. Special revelation was revealed to some, and that's the spoken word, the written word, and then finally we receive the walking word. And as we did our Bible timeline, we realized just how long a period of time was covered by the spoken word before we ever had a written word until finally the word was made flesh, and that is Jesus, of course, the walking word. Number three, special inspiration is the process by which God caused his special revelation to be communicated to man. Illumination is the Holy Spirit taking the Word of God and making it known to the believer hearts. We can cause, call this also the process by which God caused His special revelation to be known by man. It's something that each one of us needs and it's the promise that we received of Jesus that the Holy Spirit would come and abide within us and that He would be our teacher and He would lead us and guide us into all truth. And, and while this process of special inspiration giving us special revelation has been concluded and it's, we have a completed Bible, the process of illumination is something that is ongoing as God brings the word alive in each one of our hearts. Torah is the first five books of the Hebrew scripture. Number six, Pentateuch is the same as Torah. It's just another word for it because it means five. And then seven is Apocrypha. The word means hidden, and this is referring to the intertestamental, non canonical Jewish history, and you will find it in the Catholic Bible as a part of what they consider scripture. It's not in your Protestant Bibles as scripture, though we see that it really can have some benefit in giving us a little historical context between the Old and the New Testament times. Pseudepigrapha means false signature or falsely attributed. These are non-canical books. The Catholics call this the Apocrypha, and they're not accepted by either Protestants or Catholics as being scriptural. Number nine is the Sophorum. The word literally means the counters. And these were scribes who copied the scripture manuscripts. They took and did hand copies of them. And in fact, the word sophrum or sulfur will be translated in your Bibles as scribes. Number 10 is papyrus. That is a writing material made for papyrus reed. And one of the things I wanted you to note was that it's not very durable. It's important for us to understand this so we understand why we don't have any of the original documents. The original manuscripts are no longer available. Vellum was a writing material made from animal skins. It is durable. It's also called parchment. And a key word there is durable. That's why we still have in existence today some manuscripts or copies of manuscripts that were written on vellum. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. The Septuagint meaning 70 and it's abbreviated as LXX which is Roman numerals for 70. The reason it's called the 70 is because it was translated by 70 Greek speaking Hebrew scholars several hundred years before Christ. Canon of scripture 
means the books of the Old and the New Testament that measure up to the standard of Scripture. The word canon in Greek means a reed or a rod from measuring, similar to a word in Hebrew that means the same thing. Fourteen is verbal inspiration. That is, each word of the original text is inspired. Key to this, of course, is the original text. That would be Hebrew for the Old Testament and Greek for the New Testament. Plenary inspiration means the whole of the scripture is inspired, both in substance and in structure. Infallible means it cannot fail. Inerrant means it is without error. Immutable means it cannot change. Those three things are really important. Infallible, inerrant, immutable. Number 19 is hermeneutics. That's the science of interpretation, especially biblical interpretation. Make it clear and give the meaning is my short phrase to define hermeneutics. Make it clear and give the meaning. I see that in Nehemiah 8.8 8 as well. Parallel passages are other scripture passages that speak on the same subject. They might be close to exact quotes, they might even be exact quotes, or they could be inexact quotes where the same idea is being addressed. Parallel exclusions are the absence of a target text in other parallel passages. In other words, if I'm only finding this in one place in the Bible, I need to take real good care to make sure that number one, I've understood that's what scripture is talking about, and number two, it might be something that I I don't want to get off on a tangent, and I want to make sure that we don't think that we're making a doctrine out of one scripture. Remember that any doctrine of the Bible is a doctrine of the whole Bible from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. A type is an Old Testament person, place, thing, or occurrence that prefigures a person, place, thing, or occurrence in the New Testament. The antitype is that person, place, thing, or occurrence that is prefigured. It's the real thing, and it's more important than a type. That is a key to understanding typology, is to know that the type that is in the Old Testament is the shadow. It is merely the pattern. But the thing that it is pointing to in the New Testament, the fulfillment called the antitype, is the real thing. It's the thing that is important. An antithetical type is a contrasting type. We see in Joseph and Jesus a strong type, but we see in Adam and Jesus an antithetical type. That means there is a real contrast. We have 14 matchups for the 14 generations from Abe to Dave and Bab to Babe, and by that I mean Matthew chapter 1 and verse 17, we have the genealogy of Jesus divided up into three groups of 14 generations. Is that significant? I don't know, but I think it's really interesting that it's there. It must be there for a reason. And the reason I call it 14 generations from Abe to Dave is because it's from Abraham to King David, and then from David to the captivity in Babylon, and then from Babylon to Jesus coming into the world, God's Son coming in as a baby. The first one, Psalm 119, is the acrostic. Matthew 13, 52 is the simile. Of course, the key there, something is like something else. 2 Timothy 2, verses 4 through 6, we have a metaphor. I call metaphors sneaky similes. They just say something is something else. They omit the word like. 1 Corinthians 14, 2 through 4 is the antithesis. Revelation 20, verse 5 is the apostrophe. And it's really important to understand this apostrophe or you could get come to a wrong conclusion here. Genesis chapter 11, verse 4 is hyperbole. Again, that's gross exaggeration to make the point. Romans 6.1 is interrogation 
or we might call it the rhetorical question. We're really not expecting you to give an answer. We're expecting you to get the point just by the question being asked. John 3.10 is irony where the words have an opposite meaning. It's akin to sarcasm. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. That's a, a longer passage. That's a parable. I'm sure most of you got that one. Ephesians chapter 3, 17 through 21 is the building climax. Proverbs 30, 33 is a synthetic proverb. Judges 9, 8 through 15 is the fable. 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 through 15 is the synecdoche, where the part stands for the whole or the whole for the part. One thing stands for another. Proverbs 12, 21 is the antithetical proverb, where we have first a positive saying and then a negative saying, or first a negative saying and then a positive saying. We have two sides of the same coin. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 13 is the ellipsis. An ellipsis is where something is left out. It needs to be supplied by the reader. Sometimes the translators will supply it. Sometimes you can miss it altogether. It takes careful reading to know when an ellipsis needs to be added in. We have 12 multiple choice for the 12 princes of Ishmael. And this is from Genesis chapter 25, verses 12 through 17, the genealogy of Abraham's first son, Ishmael. Ishmael um, was sent off with his mother, Hagar, into the desert. Um, but God said, don't worry, Abraham, I'm going to take care of her. And he did. And in verse 16, we find that Ishmael had 12 sons. Not only did uh, Isaac have, 12, uh, have two sons, and then later on Jacob had 12 sons. We had the, the 12 tribes of Israel. But Ishmael, he went right to it and had his 12 sons, and they're called the 12 princes, and they each had their own tribe. So there, there is such a thing as the 12 tribes of Ishmael. First of all, first question, John believes that God not only created the world, but that he is still watching over it and reveals himself to mankind through the Bible. John is a nice guy, an atheist, a deist, or a theist. Well, the answer is he's a theist. He believes that God is still actively involved. Number two, when I go outside on a clear night and I look at the stars, I'm awestruck by the vastness of God's creation. This is an example of inspiration, general revelation, special revelation, or worship. Well, it's actually three of the four. It's inspiration, I'm inspired by what I see, and I'm inspired to worship God, but it's general revelation. It's what can be known by all. It's there for everyone to see. Number three, Bob read in the Bible that the wages of sin is death. This is an example of illumination, general revelation, special revelation, or warning. Well, it's, a, it's an example of special revelation, but it's also an example of a warning as well, if Bob pays attention. And sometimes people don't pay attention. Just because Bob read it doesn't mean that he got the warning. So I'm saying this is an example of special revelation. Whether Bob is illuminated or not and gets the warning is going to be up to Bob and the Holy Spirit. Number four, to study the original language of the Old Testament, I would have to learn Greek, learn Hebrew, move to Israel, or eat kosher. Well, the answer is B. I'd need to learn Hebrew. But we're going to show you how to study the scripture in the original languages without learning either Greek or Hebrew because we have study tools, language tools that will help us to do that. If you want to learn how to read Greek and if you want to learn how to read Hebrew, that's a, a worthy endeavor. Number five, Sue said that she believes the Bible is the most wonderful book imaginable. And while it might not be in step with modern science, that's okay because it was never meant to be a science textbook anyway. She says it supplies her every need, has never failed her, 
and is in fact the very Word of God. What's missing from Sue's glowing testimony? The Bible is inspired, comprehensive, infallible, or inerrant? Well, she touched on inspired and comprehensive and infallible, but it seems like she failed to believe that the Bible was without error, and so she ceded ground to modern science, which, by the way, is changing its textbooks all the time. The Bible is immutable, and no, Sue, it has no error. Number six, David Goldstein has a Torah, a Nebaim, and a Kethuvim. These are the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings, Bagels, Locks, and Cheese, the Septuagint. Well, the correct answer is the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. Now, you might have Bagels and Locks, uh, and he certainly has a Septuagint, uh, available to him. Whether he actually has one or not, I don't know. But he does have the law, the prophets, and the writings. Seven, Phil told me that the major prophets are different from the minor prophets. He is right because the minor prophets are not as important as the major prophets. He's right because the major prophets have more prophecies concerning Messiah. He's wrong because God is no respecter of persons. Or he's wrong because major and minor refer to the length of the book and not to the prophet, the quality of the prophet, or the size of the prophet. Well, D is the correct answer. Phil would be wrong because major and minor do not refer to uh, the length of the, excuse me, refer to the length of the book. They don't refer to the prophet at all. Number eight, theme and scope are oral hygiene projects, proofs of inspiration, revelations. Verbal and plenary. Well, I just threw verbal and plenary in there, and it's amazing. Sometimes people pick that one because they remember those words, but no, these are proofs of inspiration. Number nine, Carol's NIV has a note at the bottom of the page that says, oldest and best manuscripts omit verses dot, 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 that's an ellipsis. Should Carol be concerned? Yes. Oldest does not necessarily mean best. No, many great scholars have certified the accuracy of the NIV. See, no, the oldest manuscripts are obviously the best because they are closer to the originals. D, yes, it is a sin to omit anything from the Bible and God will punish people with NIVs. Well, that's not true. A is the correct answer. It's good to be concerned. It's good to be aware because oldest does not necessarily mean best and there is a reason why we have some differences in these versions. Older versions that are based upon the received text or the, the authorized text, the text that has, is called sometimes the majority text, or the, the, the Greek manuscripts that were made of three earlier copies that are sometimes divergent from one another. And some of our newer translations are built on those. You, you don't need to be unduly concerned. You just need to be aware of that difference. Number 10, Jim says that the Bible contains the Word of God. What incorrect view of inspiration does he have? Thematic inspiration? Partial inspiration? Incomplete inspiration? Mechanical inspiration? Now, someone might think that, well, if Jim says the Bible contains the Word of God, that's a good saying. The problem is that he doesn't say the Bible is the Word of God. He says it contains it. Now, he might mean that just the general themes are inspired, or he might mean that only parts of it are inspired. But when you say it contains the Word of God, you are actually saying that it's not all of the Word of God. The Bible is not just a container of truth. The Bible is truth. 11, Gloria sees visions and hears God speak to her. Gloria listens to everything God has to say and then reads the Bible to find verses that support her revelation. There's a, a key in there. It's, it's good to hear God speak through his word. It's bad when we hear God speak and then go to the Bible to figure out what that means. Gloria has direct access to special revelation. Gloria has experiential theology. Gloria has biblical theology. Correct answer here is B. She has experiential theology. 
Her theology, what she believes, is based on her experiences. And instead of letting God's word judge her experiences, what she's doing is she's judging God's word or interpreting God's word based on her experiences. That's going the wrong direction. Number 12, when Jesse found a contradiction in the Bible, he ignored it at first, but it began to bother him, and he eventually left the church because he couldn't trust religion to be true. He should have continued to ignore the difficulty, bought a new Bible, explored it, not ignore it. And C is the correct answer. When we find a difficulty, that's not time for us to shut the Bible. It's not time for us to get a different Bible. It's time for us to actually start digging and find the answer because the answer is there. We have 10 true or false for the 10 curtains of the tabernacle. That's the tabernacle that Moses was instructed to build after the pattern that God showed him on the mountain. In Exodus chapter 26 and verse 1, and also in verse 36, verse 8, we find that they did what they were told. They were instructed to make 10 curtains of fine twined linen with blue and purple and scarlet and embroider them with cherubim, these angels. They were 42 feet long, and they were 6 feet wide, and there were 10 of them. Is that significant? Everything is significant. Everything points to Jesus. But I'll have to let you figure that out later on your own. All of these are great items for studying. So here are our true-false questions. Jewish marriages were not consummated until the rabbi filled out the papers. True or false? Well, if you've been reading New Manners and Customs by Ralph Gower, you know that that's false. Jewish marriages were consummated by a sexual union. Jewish women enjoyed equal rights with men. Well, again, that's false. Unfortunately, women were considered in that culture almost as chattel goods, almost as property of their husbands. And consequently, they were not treated very well either. Everywhere the gospel of Jesus Christ is gone, the condition of women has been elevated. Because in Christ, it doesn't matter whether we're bond or free, male or female, rich or poor, we're all one in Jesus. Cloak and tunic were different names for the same garment. Again, this is false. They were two different garments. The Jewish calendar had 28 days in each month. That one's true. And the Jewish day began at sundown. That's true. It's still true. Our day here in the Western world begins at sunup. In fact, actually, it begins before sunup. For some of us, but the Jewish day begins at sundown. Herod was a family name. That's true. There was a, a line of Herods, and it was also a title as well. It wasn't just one person named Herod. Jewish women are more likely to contract cervical cancer. Well, that's actually false. The bundle of the living refers to the pouch that held food. And that's true. Is it really important for you to know that? Well, there's probably a lot of other things that are more important than that, but it's one way for me to find out if you actually read the book, whether you got this one correct or not. The grapevine is a symbol of the nation Israel. That is true. Some people think that the fig tree is the sign of the nation Israel. I'm not so sure that that one's true. I'll let you search that out yourself. This is one that we see in a lot of nativity scenes. Joseph walked while Mary rode the donkey. That one is false. It would have been false in that culture at any rate. We have three fill in the blanks for the three that bear witness in heaven. I took that from 1 John 5, 7. The three that bear witness in heaven are the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. But I wanted to point out to you that there are those that doubt that that actually belongs in Scripture because it doesn't appear in any of the earlier manuscripts. In fact, it only appears in one manuscript before the invention of the printing press. 
but that doctrine, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, appears all through the Bible. And we can find, we can find it in other scriptures as well. But it's just something you need to know about 1 John 5, 7 that is not universally accepted as belonging there. Number one, the new is in the old contained, the old is in the new explained. That should be easy to commit to memory. In fact, we'll probably see that again on a test. Number two, the Bible is Christocentric. And number three, the Bible is its own best interpreter. And then one essay question for the one true God. This is out of John chapter 17, where Jesus says the same thing, that there is one true God in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Your essay question should contain these elements. It should contain something about inspiration, perhaps with the words verbal, plenary, and original languages. Those are all important concepts. It should have something about infallible, inerrant, immutable. And then number three, it should have something about authority, that scripture is the authority for all faith and all practice. Now, if you're not convinced of this, I don't want you to write that down as though that were your doctrinal statement. I don't want you just to say, well, that's what I learned at Contenders Bible School. I want you to know what you believe and why you believe it so that you can be not only fully persuaded but able to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So if you're not sure about these, you need to do more study. You need to find out what you believe about inspiration and how deep do you think that inspiration goes. You need to understand what you believe about the nature of Scripture. Is it truly infallible? Is it without error? Is it unchangeable? Is it immutable? And then you need to come to terms with the authority for your life. When you finally come to this understanding of Scripture, though, that the Bible is the authority for all faith and practice, and then you speak from the Bible, you will be able to speak like Jesus spoke. And the scribes were amazed because he spoke not as they did. He spoke as one who had authority. And we want to make sure that we're not just speaking our ideas or the ideas of men. If we're going to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints, we need to speak with the authority of God, and the authority of God comes from nowhere other than His Word. That's what you and I have to preach from. And this ends our midterm test and review.